Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 25, again, just getting a lot in, uh, uh, more into the uh, just civil matters, you know, how to, how to deal with certain things when it comes to uh, society and so on and so forth, and even with kind of familial, familial ma uh, matters as well. <laughs> In the case of, you know, a brother and a sister-in-law, you know, when a, when a man dies. But um, we'll just get it right into it here in verse 1. It says, if there be a controversy between men and they come into, unto judgment, and that the judges judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the, uh, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. For uh, forty stripes may he give him and not exceed, lest he should exceed and, and beat him above the, uh, with these with many stripes. Then thy brother shall seem vile unto thee. So, you know, this is something that's certainly fallen out of style in our, uh, you know, modern judicial system, which is, you know, a public beating. Right? Right. Basically, that's what this is talking about. You know, in God's justice system, if we recall, we're going through Deuteronomy, there's only really three fines that you find in God's law, three penalties for, for uh, breaking the law. You know, death was one of them. We talked about that at length already. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the fines, you know, being fined a certain amount of money, having to pay back what you've stolen, and a physical beating is the other thing we see here. You know, this isn't, uh, this isn't allegorical. You know, this isn't, you know, uh, symbolic. This is literally telling the guy, oh, he's going to lay down, and you're going to take a rod and beat him before the judge. Now you say, well, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of brutal. You know, that, man, that seems pretty tough. You know, well, we as a society have gotten pretty soft towards a lot of things. And that might kind of, you know, take us aback. But there's a few things in here that we should keep in mind when we read this. One, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and beaten before his face. Meaning the judge is going to sit there and watch the, 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 the punishment be carried out. You know, which, and then that's why it says, you know, he, he should only cause him to be beaten with so many stripes. So if you actually have to sit there and watch the judgment that you just doled out be carried out on another individual, you know, you as a judge are probably going to be, you know, try to be as fair as you possibly can. You know, he gives a specific number. He says you shouldn't beat him more than 40 times as you seem vile unto your brother. You know, if a judge got up there and said, yeah, just beat him 50 times, and everyone's going to be like, whoa, judge, you know, you got a problem, man. But so he's, he's supposed to sit there and actually watch this take place. Which, quite frankly, is a lot better than what we see in our judicial system, if you ask me. I mean, a judge can just dole out a life sentence on somebody, 20 years, 15, 25 years, whatever, and then just not see that person again for the rest of his life. Yep. Meanwhile, that person has to go live in a cell with, you know, we're going to get into a minute about, what you know, the people that are there. And the judge just goes about his merry way. You know, at the end of the day, he takes the robe off, he gets in his, you know, Mercedes or whatever, drives to his big house, and, you know, life's good. Whereas, you know, in this system, he has to sit there and actually watch what he's doling out take place. You know, I mean, we as parents, we probably, if we're the type of parents that do what the Bible says and actually beat our children, and by beat, I don't mean smack around, I mean take the, the, the rod of correction and apply it to the, the seed of learning, you know, spanking. You know, we as parents that do that, you know, we're, we don't, we're not, there's, there's a limit to what we're going to do when it comes time to do that to our children. You know, every parent is, you know, some parents are even a little too hesitant. Maybe they're just, you know, they do the little, you know, don't do that again, you know, and then they wonder why their kid does it again, you know. So it's kind of the same thing. You know, we have to sit there and watch this, this individual take what we're doling out. You know, that's going to cause us to be, hopefully, more merciful, mm -hmm. more compassionate, and try to be fair, you know. And God doesn't put a number on there. He says that he's going to beat him. Uh, you know, according to the number, you know, it's kind of up to the judge to say, oh, you did this? Well, you know, according to what the situation and everything and your attitude when you showed up here and, you know, how you behaved yourself while this was all taking place, you know, you're going to get X amount of beatings. You're going to take 20, so many stripes. But uh, <laughs> there, the people say, well, our system's better. You know, that's why we have prisons. That's why we have a prison system, because the prisons are better than God's system. But let me just clue you in on something. Prisons do not exist because they're more humane. In fact, in my opinion, they're less humane. Yeah. Prisons don't exist because they're humane or they're better than God's system. They exist because prisons make money. Yeah, right. that's right. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. That's why prisons exist today. They exist to make money. In fact, I, I looked into this. We're going to have a little, we're gonna, I don't, you're probably too far away to see most of this, but I've got some data for you tonight. You know how I love my, my colorful charts, right? 
So there's this following the money of mass incarceration, right? At the end, you end up with $182 billion that goes into the judicial system as it is today. A year, right? Uh, you know, the public corrections agencies, things like prisons, jails, parole, probation, $80.7 $80 billion. That's what it costs. Public employees that have to do all the administrative work, $38.4 billion with a B. Healthcare, you, know, you got to take care of the prisoners while they're in there, $12.3 billion. Construction, just building some of these facilities and maintaining them, $3.3 billion. This is a year, folks. And this should really appeal to the, you know, the, the, the right-wing so-called conservatives, right, who all are about, you know, just phys fiscal conservancy and just want to cut, cut spending. You know, here's a good place to start right here. Right. You know, get back to God's word and you can, you could cut out a lot of spending. What else could you do with $182 billion a year? Yeah, right. You know, give it to me, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't give it to me. But uh, interest payments, you know, you, you know what it costs you to go to jail? It's not just that you're being punished, but you actually end up having to pay to go there. Uh, food to feed everybody, 2.1 billion. Utilities, 1.7 billion. Private corrections, which is booming. Private prisons are 3.9 billion. And then the private prisons actually profit 0.37 billion, or 370 million dollars per year. So don't tell me that's not an industry. Don't tell me it's not you know about making money. You say, well, no, that's how much it costs us. Yeah, if it's costing you that much, I mean somebody's making that much. Right. You know, it's not, it's not just going into thin air. Right. Some that money's going from one pocket to another. And I'm not going to go on and on about this portion of it, but you can kind of see, you know, one one thing that's wrong with our prison system today is that. It, it's there. They're there to make money. That's the point of that chart. I mean, that's the first point I'm making. They're not there. Let's get it out of our minds that they're there to just reform everybody and they're there to just make better, you know, people out of the people that go there and help them get back on their feet and move on with their life. That's not why they're there. They're there to make money. That's it. <clears throat> and what happens is it leads to corruption. When you have that much money just flying around, you know, people they, they get sticky fingers. And they start to come up with ways. Who remembers the Kids for Cash scandal? No one? Well, you're going to love this. No one's ever heard of the Kids for Cash scandal? I'll just read it to you. The Kids for Cash scandal centered on judicial kickbacks to two judges at the Luzerne County Court of Common Pleas in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. In 2008, Judges Michael Cohan, uh, Cohan and Mark Caravella, if that's how you say it, were accused of accepting money in return for imposing harsh adjudications on juveniles wow. to increase occupancy at for-profit detention centers. So they're getting, the detention centers like kicking them back some money and be like, hey, make that a little bit harder on these kids. Send us a few more kids, keep them there longer, you know, so we can make a little bit more money off of them. They make money off of inmates, off of these kids. Juveniles, I mean minors. You know, kids. That, there's kids this age in this room this evening. That, I mean, can you imagine that? That going and, you're, and this judge is just getting up and just, you know, maybe the kid, you know, spray painted something or threw a rock through a window or did something stupid, and he just just drops the hammer on him because he's getting a kickback. It's wicked. This happened to two judges in Pennsylvania back in 2008. Uh, Kira Bella disposed thousands of children to extended stays in youth centers for uh, for offenses as trivial as mocking an assistant principal. <laughs> Just getting wise, getting wise with the principal. Now, should a kid do that? No. But should he go spend however long? I mean, should he spend a day in a juvenile detention center for getting a lippy? No. He should be told, and his dad should be around and deal with it, but it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, oh, and it was on MySpace, by the way, that he did that. He mocked, he mocked some assistant principal on, on MySpace, and this judge just like, juvenile detention. And, and the guy, because the juvenile detention center is just lining his pockets. Right. You know, he's, he's getting that money. After a judge, after a judge uh, rejected an initial plea agreement in 2009, a federal grand jury returned a 48-count indictment. In 2010, Cohan pleaded guilty to one count of racketeering conspiracy and was sentenced to 17.5 years in federal prison. Right. I mean, if you're a judge, <laughs> it's the last place you want to end up. What are you in for? Uh, <laughs> let me see your rap sheet, buddy. Uh, boy, he'd be sweating bullets. Uh, Caravelli opted to go to trial the following year. He was convicted on 12 of 39 counts and sentenced to 28 years in, prison, in federal prison. 
So this is just a perfect example. Now, you know, you say, oh, that's just one story. How many story, how many, how many of them are not getting caught? How much of this going on where they're just getting away with it? That's right. With this kind of thing where this just corruption is taking place. You know, love of money is the root of all evil. And when you have, you know, a hundred plus billion dollars in an industry, you know, and there's people in positions that can make other people more money by what by their actions. Don't think that it's a really that far fetched to think that somebody might come and you know and grease the palm a little bit as it is. So first of all, you see that prisons, you know, you say, well, the beating there, that's just so harsh. You know, well, the prison industry has got, you know, there's a lot of worse things that have happened there. And first of all, we have to understand it's not that the prison system is better. It's there to make money, which leads to corruption. Okay. And then uh, the other thing I want us to just notice tonight is that let's, let's, well, let's just look at it. Let's look at God's way. Let's compare it God's way to man's way. And let's see which way is cheaper, right? That's, that's like... You know, the, that's the first thing we brought up with, right? Is, is, is God's ways cheaper? So you have, you have one, it's right now, it's estimated there's about 1.3 billion, that's not right, 1.3 million people in, 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 in some kind of penitentiary right now. 1.3 million people. And, uh, and what I want to do is just focus on this one side of the chart here. And this side of the chart is just state prisons, okay? Because all this over here is pretty much just a smaller version of this. Right. If they're in there for the same reasons, they're just at a different facility for different reasons. So let's just look at this chart right here. Okay, I know you can't see this, so if you just follow along with me. But <clears throat> this chart shows us that there's uh, 9,000 people are, are in prison for other. That's kind of a vague thing. What are you here for? I'm here for other. You know. So right there, I don't know what they're in there for, but I bet it's not for any reason they should be there. And then uh, you've got another people, that 51,000 people in jail. Okay, that are there for weapons. All right, they're in there for weapons. Now, should they be there according to the Bible for weapons? No. Okay, nope. Bible says in Luke 22, Jesus said, Then he said unto them, But now he that hath the purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. You know, we have a right to bear arms. People should be able to, to you know, buy arms quite freely. You know, it shouldn't be such a regulated thing. Right. That's a whole other sermon. Okay, maybe you don't agree with that. But, if, you know, that's what they're there for, for, for guns, weapons, okay? Uh, then the other group we have in there are people, 25,000, that are in there for driving under the influence, DUI. Now, do I approve of you driving under the influence? No. I don't think you should look at alcohol, let alone drink it. That's what the Bible says. Look not upon the wine when it can color the cup, when it moves itself right. Okay? You shouldn't be looking at it, let alone drinking it, let alone drinking it, and then getting behind a wheel, Okay? Now, here's the thing. If people drive, people are driving under the influence all the time, and, and, they're, and they're doing it and getting away with it all the time. They manage to get to where they're going, and everything turns out fine, right? But everyone, you know, not, that's not always the case. You know, a lot of people end up killing other people, hurting other people. So that would move the DUI people into a different category, in my opinion. You know, that, that actually, if you went out and did that, and, and, and hurt somebody or, or, or damage their property, you should be moved, this statistic should be moved into another category like manslaughter. Really, I would probably call it murder. You know, if you knowingly got yourself drunk and then got behind of a wheel, whether you were intending to do it or not, and then, and then got a 2,000 plus pound you know, piece of steel and then barreled it down a freeway at 80 miles an hour while you're drunk and killed somebody, I don't know that I'm ready to call it. That's pretty much murder in my book. Yeah. You know, but they, you could call it manslaughter. We still give it that. So there's 25,000 people that probably need just to be moved over. And then you've got 153,000 and another 45,000 people that are in for drugs and drug possession. Okay? Now, that doesn't deserve to be punished right. by the law. You know, it, it, it's its own punishment, folks. Am I condoning that people should be, you know, taking drugs? No, of course not. But, you know, if people... People would just learn to quit taking drugs. You wouldn't even, you know, they, you wouldn't need a prison system. And the people aren't going into jail and getting off drugs. You know, they're getting drugs in jail. You can get drugs in prison. You can get drugs in jail. You can get, you know, they come out and they're right back on it. Um, that's a that's what's called a uh, 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 what's the term I'm looking for? <clears throat> a victimless crime, right. right? Drugs. Are they harming themselves? Of course. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you can and can't put in your body. I'm going to tell you you can't deal with the consequences, the health consequences, 
you know, if you're a member of the church and you're getting drunk or high on, on a regular basis, you're out. Yeah. You know, but I don't think people should be locked up in a cage for smoking a plant. You know, or however they ingest it. Amen. So, and then here's another one. People are in jail for fraud. Okay, now if you would turn over to Exodus 22. Exodus 22. Keep something in Deuteronomy. Stay with me. And I know I'm reading a lot, but just stay with me. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to compare man's system to God's, to God's system. And let's see whether or not, you know, this lines up with, with what's in the Bible. Do people deserve to be, rather than having the, the punishment that God has doled out in his word, do they deserve to be sitting in a cell with just the worst elements of society next to them? And, you know, people go in there for, for reasons as simple as, you know, they got caught with some crack on them or something. You know, they have bigger problems than, than that, that, that jail's going to fix. That jail's not what they need, right? Right. They need, some, they need help, another type of help. What they don't need is to be put in there next to, like, a rapist, go to jail with a murderer, you know, go to jail with somebody who's just committed horrific crimes, and then maybe even become a victim of that person in jail. That happens a lot. But fraud, okay? So 25,000 people are, are there for fraud. And what's fraud? It just comes down to stealing, right? I'm swindling you out of money. You know, I'm saying, hey, sign the contract here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build you this house, or I'm going to do this work, and then I don't do it. And I try to get away with it. That kind of a thing. Well, what's the Bible say about fraud or stealing? Look at Exodus 22, verse 5. If a man cause a field or vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his beast and shall feed in another man's field of the beast of his own field and the best of his own vineyard, and he shall make restitution. Right? So he's putting in his own beast. He's like, oh, my, my field suffered, so I'm going to put my beast in your field, and I'm going to let him eat off your crop. Right? What's, that's stealing. Right? It's the same thing. Right. And he says, he shall make restitution. Not he shall go sit in a concrete cell you know, and wear orange or whatever and eat slop. He's going to actually make restitution to the person that he stole from. If fire break out and catch in thorns so that the stacks of corn or standing corn of the field be consumed therewith, he that kindleth the fire shall surely go to jail for arson. No, he shall make restitution. He shall pay back. Because here's the problem when you're just sending these people to jail. The, the victim yep. is not getting paid back. That's right. Oh, great, he's in jail. He can't work. You know, when he gets out, he's going to have a hard time finding a job. Yep. He's not going to pay me back. He's going to have to pay the prison for his stay there. For the state for a stay there, you know, he's not going to be able to pay me back. In God's system, the victim gets paid back. That's way better. I mean, if you were the victim, what, what would you rather have? This have the him just go to jail and the state and, the, and make all this money off of him, or or at your expense? Now you're out. You're not making any money, but they're making money. I'd rather be have restitution. Let the guy out. Let him pay me back, and then let him go on with his life. That's what should happen. He says here, If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor his money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let it pay double. If the thief be not found, the master of the house shall, bring, uh, shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand to his neighbor's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be of ox or for ass or for sheep or for raiment, for any manner of lost thing which another challenges to be his, the cause, both, uh, the cause of both parties shall come before the judge. To whom the judge shall get condemned, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. You know, that almost makes me want to leave. If that were the law, I'd probably leave the keys in the ignition at night. Be like, come on, man, that thing's an 07. Yeah. I, get my, I get double my money back to go buy a new car, right? And like, that's a good system. You know, the gate's open, just like, no, oh, I'm just going to leave the cars in the, the keys in the car, honey. Sure hope nobody takes it and gets caught, you know. Just have a little stakeout. Not any wicked, but you know, a little bait, bait car, you know, just so I can make a little money, you know. That would be corruption. That would be fraud. I'd probably end up paying somebody else to do it. Anyway, I'm just making a dumb joke. What about burglary? There's 127,000 people sitting in jail for burglary, which is just another form of stealing. Rather than doing it, you know, by sleight of hand or, you know, just being, you know, crafty and doing it wildly and, and just trying to, like, you know, the old bait and switch. This is just straight up, I'm going to break in your house and take something out of it and run. Burglary. You know, it's just a smash and grab kind of thing. Exodus 22, verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood, blood be shed for him. Now, you got to keep reading, okay? <clears throat> Everybody in Texas. 
All right, <laughs> stand your ground, right? Well, if I find something, this is, listen, I'm not gonna shoot somebody over stuff. If you're willing, I hear guys say this, I'm like, I'm not plugging anybody because they, they ran in and grabbed, you know, what do I have that's valuable? I don't, I don't know, <laughs> they took my car or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, my thank you, a laptop, right? They grabbed your cell phone, that's it. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't care if they came in and took your entire, your sound system and your, your big screen and, and everything else. You know, what if they just clean you, you just, you come home one day and they've got a rider truck backed up and the whole house is empty. I've known people that, I've, I've done lock work for people in the past, that happened to them. They came home from working out of town and the place is just cleaned out. They left like the carpet, like one little square of a rug. You know, just whoop, it's gone. And you you come in, they're, you know, they're pulling the door down, they get in the car, they're trying to make their getaway. Just, you know, da -da 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 you know, I'm gonna light them up. No way, I wouldn't do it. And that, what you say, but what does it say there? Exodus 22, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten at he die, there shall no be, be shed, blood be shed for him. Verse three clarifies it. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall, uh, there shall be blood uh, shed for him, uh, for he, uh, excuse me, there shall be blood shed for him, for he shall make re full restitution. Meaning this, there shall be blood shed for him, meaning this, if I did that, if I, if I killed a thief during the day, my blood would be shed for him. They would kill me. They'd say you had you were unjustified. You know, and that's what, you know, we, we love the fact that we can carry weapons here, you know, but we really ought to think about the fact that if you ever use your weapon, the cops aren't just gonna you're you're not they're just not gonna Oh, I had to shoot him, officer, why? And you give them the reason, they're like, Oh, sounds good, okay. Have a good day. No, there's gonna be an investigation. You're probably gonna get booked. You might even have to get a lawyer, could go to court. You know, unless there's just like multiple witnesses on site, video, where the cops can just say, yeah, no doubt about it, defense. They, they won't press charges. So, you know, we can't just go around <laughs> just shoot people in broad daylight because they, you know, grabbed our wallet and ran, you know, or, or they were stealing from somebody else and we stopped it with the weapon, you know. And I've known guys that have done that, that have, that have drawn a gun on somebody that was just stealing something out of a liquor store or something like that. You know, they just, they grab somebody's wallet off of a table or something. I can't remember exactly the details. But the guy chased him down and put a gun at him and told him to get in the ground. And I told him, man, I just let him go. Call the cops, let him deal with it. You know, I mean, when you excel, when you, you know, when you uh, escalate a situation like that by drawing a firearm, you know, they're gonna take a long look at the guy drawing the firearm. Keep that in mind. I know, I know we're here in Arizona and we're all packing heat, right? But, you know, we watch a little too much ASP sometimes, you know, in your American active self-protection. Yeah, okay, it's a plug for him, right? You guys are watching that. I'm like, this isn't Brazil, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, anyway, but he's saying, when shall you, when can you shoot a thief? What he says here, uh, you know, if, if the, uh, it's if he, get, he breaks in at night. You know, if he comes in at night, look, if somebody breaks in your house at night, how do you know they're there to steal something? Right. They could be there to do who knows what. You know, and at night, when everybody else is asleep, crying out for help might not be good enough. You know, he's not going to just run out the door and, and be seen by a bunch of witnesses. You know, yeah, he stole that. You know what I mean? And when he's coming at night, he's trying to do something extra devious. You know, and so... That's a good way to get shot, is breaking into somebody's house. And that would be justified at that point. You would say, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> so if the thief be found a lie, uh, uh, be, uh, if, if the theft be found certainly, uh, found, excuse me, if the theft be found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass, or uh, this is verse four, he shall restore double. You know, that's the punishment in God's law for burglary, for breaking into someone's house and stealing something. Is you have if you get found and you have it, you're like look, you're going to give it back and then you're going to give another one. You know, so that's that's God's rule. Not go sit in a penitentiary somewhere for X amount of years. <clears throat> theft. Forty-eight thousand people are are in there for theft. Uh, Nine thousand are in prison today for car theft. Other property. Twenty-six thousand. The Bible says in Exodus twenty-two verse one, if a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore. restore Five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. God's law is that the victim gets paid back. 
But man's law is so that the system can make money right. and make merchandise of people. True. Now, moving on here, we'll get into other things. There's 160, 3,000 people in prison today for rape. Okay, so there's a lot more people in there for rape today than even you know drugs. There's more people in rape in there for rape today than theft. 163,000 people are in there for for raping, for you know assaulting somebody physically like that. So what's God's law? You know, well God's law. If you remember a few weeks ago in Deuteronomy 22 verse five, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, then the man that lay with her shall die. You know, talking about forcing her. You know, that's talking about rape. God puts the death penalty upon rape. You know, and we talked about that, and that's not something I want to go on and on about. But bam, that would free up some prison space. We have this big, you know, overcrowding problem, right? Well, let's just kill the rapists. Yeah. You know, because here's, let's, let's face it. You know, in my opinion, you probably have to take it case by case, but I bet the vast majority of rapists are, are, are probably um, reprobate. That's right. I mean, to have the kind of mindset where you're thinking, I'm going to go out and do that to somebody. Right. I mean, you have to be so past feeling at that yep. point. To just, just without a conscience, to be able to do that. That's right. And a lot of these serial killers and things like that, that was part of what they did. You know? So, yeah, get rid of them. That's what the Bible says. Um, manslaughter. There's 18,000 people sitting in jail today for manslaughter. Deuteronomy 19, we went through it a few weeks ago. The city of refuge. That's God's solution. You know, Deuteronomy 19, verse 3. Thou shalt prepare thee away and divide the coast of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither, and this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, right? He's talking, this is what manslaughter is. When he didn't mean to do it, it was an accident. Whom he hated not in times past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke to act, cut an axe down, uh, to, with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the hell, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee into one of those cities and live. So that's God's solution for manslaughter, that people should just you know, be allowed to live out their life. There is still a punishment attached to it. You know, the fact that they have to go to one of these cities and dwell there until the death of the high priest. If you want to know more about that, Deuteronomy 19, it, got up, it just got uploaded. Okay, I know it's been a while, but it just got uploaded. Um, what about murder? There's 179,000 people in jail today, for, in prisons, for murder. So that's great. That's who you're sending the pot smoker to. And that's who you're saying, the guy who, you know, stole a car stereo, you know, repeatedly. Or, and, you know, it's his third offense, like ripping, ripping somebody off or whatever. You're sending him there with 179,000 murderers and 163,000 rapists. You know, what is God's solution? Genesis 9, you know. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by, man's, by man shall his blood be shed. Be shed. God's law is you, you kill somebody, you're going to get killed. You know, capital punishment. So who does that leave left over for the jail system to make money off of? Nobody. Right. No one. That's every crime there is. I mean, that's every form of crime there is. You know, so this shouldn't even exist. You know what's interesting about this is there's people that are just sitting in there waiting to just, to even, that aren't even being, that aren't even booked yet. Not convicted. <laughs> They're just sitting in there. A full right to a, a swift a trial in this country, but apparently not. And they make money off of them, too. So we see, first of all, that God's way, you know, is, is cheaper, right? And, way, and we could really cut down the costs by just getting rid of, you know, the people that deserve to die and basically letting other people that shouldn't even be there out and then making everybody else that stole something pay back their neighbor that they stole from. You know, that would stimulate the economy, wouldn't it? If every, it's biblical. Uh, you know, it's humane. I mean, if you think it's humane to put five, you know, over a half a million people in a cell that don't deserve to be there, in a cage, basically, in a giant cage, you know, you should probably step back and reevaluate, you know, your values in life. They, they should be out working, those people. The people that don't deserve to either be dead or not be there at all, you know, they should be out working, you know, rehabilitating themselves through hard work and making a living. And then the big part of it, we saw like one, some of the biggest spending on that chart, that first chart, was 80.7 in, in parole and 80.7 billion on parole and probation. 
You know, people, when they pay their, do their time, even, and you want to use the system, they should be able to do that and then move on with their life. Yeah, that's right. And not just have this thing hanging over their head, not have some record hanging over their head. Yep. That's not what God does to us. It's wicked. You know, he, when we're forgiven by God, he says he separated, he, as far as the east is from the west, he has separated us from our sins. He caught, cast them by in his back. They're in the sea of God's forgetfulness. You know, we could bring up those old sins to God and be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. That's how much God's forgotten them. They're under the blood. And when somebody pays their dues, when somebody's, you know, paid back their debt, it should be forgotten. And that applies not just to the judicial system, but even when in church discipline. You know, when somebody's disciplined by the church, according to 1 Corinthians 5, if they're guilty of the sins that are in there, and they're kicked out from the church, but then they get it right, they should be welcomed back with open arms. And it should not be mentioned unto them again. And that's, that's a whole other sermon as well. So God's way is, is cheaper it's biblical, it's more humane, and it's more effective. Go over to Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. You say, why does God command you to lie down before the judge and be beaten with the rod? Because it works. Because physical pain is a powerful deterrent. That's right. You know, some people in some cultures, going to prison is a rite of passage. It's not a deterrent. Right. It's like, oh, when are you going to be a man and go to prison? Like, you know, your daddies and your uncles and everybody else. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of pride for some people. It's crazy to think that way, but it's true. <laughs> the Bible says, you're in Proverbs 26, it says Proverbs 10, in Proverbs 10, In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. You know, the foolish person, the best thing that they could ever do to help them learn is to get a beating. You know, I mean, that's not what it says about our children. That the, that, the, that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the, the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. It's the same way even as adults, when we, when we do even more heinous crimes than, you know, push our sister. Right. Or push our brother, you know, sisters. They're guilty too, right? Even when, a, when, a, when an adult does something worse, you know, he's saying beat them like you would any fool, anyone that has foolishness bound in their heart. Physical pain is a powerful deterrent. Look there, Proverbs 26, verse 3. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Say, that's so barbaric. Well, are they still whipping horses? Yeah. You ever see them whipping the horse to get it to run faster? Are they still putting bridles in the, in the mouth of the ass or the mule or the horse? Yeah. They're still doing that. still works. I wonder if that last one still works. You know, these are all effective. We wouldn't call that barbaric, but I guarantee you that the, if we start, if this was implemented, it would it would work. Yep. And there's still there's some countries, and I probably should research that more, that do do this. I remember I don't know if it's still the case, but I remember I don't know how long ago it was. Some kid was in I think Singapore. We were just talking about how clean of a place Singapore is, and he went out and he was on vacation, some American tourist, and he spray painted. He started just marking up the place, graffiti, and he got arrested. And they came the back of his legs. <laughs> they took a piece of bamboo and just whack right across his, the back of his legs. Right. I bet you that kid, every time he saw a spray paint can, he's like, <laughs> he'd go to Ace Hardware and just PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's all up in arms about it. And Singapore's like, we don't care. And, right. how, and they were like, look how clean our city is. Yep. Because it works. <laughs> so... Go over to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 19, a servant will not be corrected by words. You know, some people, just the talking to isn't going to work for them. You know, I'm going to go in front of the judge and be like, well, I'm going to give you 15 years and you're going to go sit and stew in the cell and then you're going to have to talk to your probation officer and yada, yada, yada. And you're going to get a chewing out. Society's going to look down at you. You know, just, just this harsh talking to isn't going to work. You know, and, 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 but what, 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 what is, what's he inferring there? That something else will work. The beating, right? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. What's it talking about, the blueness of a wound? It's talking about a bruise. You know, when that guy lays down and he just gets hit with that, he's not just going to spring back up and be like, oh, go on about his business. Anyone who's ever gotten a spanking like that, you know, or, 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 or beating like that knows when you have a, or just injured in general, you know, have you ever gotten a real bad bruise somewhere? Man, I remember once when I was doing roofing, I fell through a, I was walking along the sill plate, 
and I, my foot caught a nail, and I went through, and my feet went through the guy's drop tile. But I landed right here, you know, on my, 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 my back parts, on the guy's sill plate. It was just like, thud. And then I got a bruise like that big. And <laughs> I was sitting like this a lot, you know, <laughs> driving my van or whatever, driving my car. You know, it was with me for a few days. And guess what I thought about? That stupid nail, right? That I tripped on. I thought about what happened over and over. You know, if this guy lays down and he gets a beating before the judge for something that he did, he's going to think about it for a while. Right. He's going to go home and be like, oh, you know, try to take the coat off. You know, you're stiff, you're, 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 you're hurting, you're in pain. You know, you're going to think about what caused that. Oh, why did I get beat? <laughs> oh, because I did this. So the next time you go to do that again, you're going to go, is it worth the beating that I'll get? Right? It works. Okay? And anyone who's raising their children the way the Bible instructs us to knows that's the truth. That when you start to discipline your children by spanking, it works. I mean, people, my, you know, my wife is getting compliments out all the time with the kids. Oh, they're so well behaved. They listen to you. My wife will say, come here. And they come. And people are just like, how did you get them to do that? <laughs> oh, your kids are so well behaved. We say thank you. And they like that part. They don't see everything that goes on at home. <laughs> right? They don't like that part. They go, oh, you, you're such brutes. How could you do that to your kids? Well, the Bible says to. And God knows best, and it's what works. You know, I didn't get it growing up. You know, we got a lot of yelling at, you know, and I'm not trying to, you know, put any of my parents down at all, but we didn't get it like we should have. And we got in a lot of trouble and things, you know, that we probably wouldn't have done if we'd gotten the right way. So that's what the Bible's teaching in Proverbs 20, verse 30. Blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes, right? That's like the beating, the stripe that it leaves on the back. Uh, stri the stripes, the inward parts of the belly. It's not, it's not just going to affect the back. It's going to get in there where your emotions are and your logic is. And the inward person is going to be transformed. They're going to be what? cleansed of the evil that's in there. So that's what the Bible teaches. You know, death, fines, or a shameful public beating. I mean, it's not just the beating. It's that it's being done in front of... I mean, I, I can't imagine anything more humiliating, really. I mean, I probably could if I tried, but it's a grown man having been forced to lie down before another grown man and let him just beat me with the rod. I mean, that would be, pretty... <laughs> that would be bad. Something's gone ter terribly wrong if I'm in that position, right? It's, it's hard enough to get me to, you know, guy to use his turn signal on the freeway, you know, <laughs> or get out of the way when you're trying to get past him, let alone, you know, get him to lay down in front of you and take the beating, you know, right? <clears throat> and it would probably come down to, hey, if you don't lay down, we're going to force you down, you know? It's a shameful thing. <clears throat> and it's effective. It cleanses away the evil. And it doesn't lead to the problem the prison system has of, well, hopefully I say it right, recidivism. Recidivism, which is when people go out and commit the same crimes they just got punished for. You know, they, they rescind back in their old ways, right? According to April 2011 report by the Pew Center in the States, the average national recidiv recidivism rate for released prisoners is 43%, almost half. Just go back out and do it again. After a year, how many years of prison? Then they just go back out and do it again. According to the National Institute of Justice, almost 44% of the recently released return before the end of their first year out. Almost half come right back. It's not working. It's not cleansing away the evil. It's not, it's not cleansing the inward parts of the belly. About 68% of 405,000 prisoners released in 30 states in 2005 were arrested for a new crime within three years of their release from prison. And 77% were released, arrested within five years. And by year nine, that number reached 83%. Within a decade, 83% of the people that were let out of these prisons are back. 83%. It doesn't work unless you're in it to make money. You love those numbers if you are in prison. You love those kind of rates if you're in it to make money. And that's what they're there for. It's not about reforming people. 
But we got to move on. We got, we're only at verse 4. It says in verse 4, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. So this is kind of one of those verses that's just, boop, you know, in there. You got all these verses about, you know, what to do with the guy, you know, the beating that he should receive, how it's to be carried out, and then it just it jumps to this, and then it just moves on from there, right? So what is this here for? It, it, it's, it, it's symbolic in its purpose, is what it is. It's, because here's the thing, it's not because God cares about the oxen. In fact, that's, that's what it tells us in the New Testament. It's symbolic in its purpose. So right out of the gate, you know, let me just dispel any notions in the room that God does not overestimate the worth of animals. God does not overestimate the worth of an animal. And we're living in a society that just lifts animals up. You know, the dolphin free tuna. I want to know what the dolphin tastes like. Maybe it's good. I'm just kidding. But, you know, I do believe the Bible does teach conservancy and all that. But people today, they're putting stupid bumper stickers on their car. I like my dog better than you. Yep. That's right. And they're, they mean it. Dogs, because people suck. Excuse the crass language. But that's what they, I've seen that. And they're elevating dogs and animals above people. God doesn't. Then that's not what this verse is teaching. You know, the sympathy for the animal. Right? That's not what he's teaching. I mean, let's just think about let's just think about some of the ways God treated animals in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And while you think about it, you go over to Luke chapter eight. Luke chapter eight. How about the first animal that He skinned in Genesis for Adam and Eve and when they put on the, the fig aprons? Right. He's like, no, no, that's not going to do. Your plant-based vegan, you know, your stupid hemp clothing. He, he needs some leather, right? And he right. went out and skinned an animal. Mm-hmm. How about the flood where he just Rounds every animal, save two or seven of the clean, unclean and clean. Except just for the few that he saved on the on the ark. The fishes live, people. <laughs> there wasn't an aquarium on the ark. How about the Old Testament sacrifices? Yep. Where God just like bring these sacrifices continually and kill them before me and burn them. How about when Jesus, for the sake of one demoniac, sends the spirits into the swine and runs them off a cliff to drown in the sea. Mm-hmm. Chokes them in the sea, the Bible says. Amen. Doesn't even hesitate. Doesn't even think about it. You know, the demons are like, send us into the swine. He's like, well, the poor swine. You know, Miss Piggy? You know, no, I couldn't do that. Not Peppy Pig. Not him. He's like, go. And they ride violently down off the edge of the cliff and drown. So there's, you know, there's a few instances where God's just not even caring about animals. And this, you know, I was talking to somebody about this recently, but and I don't, I don't remember all the details, but I just, I just remember I expressed this at one point. I said, you know what? I look at animals, all I see are animated objects. They're, they're, it's like a chair that has a heart in it. <laughs> I'm dead serious. That's how I view animals. They're just things that God has animated. Yep. You know, they, it's, it's no different than... Anything else in the world that's not human, it's just some, it's just an animated, animated object. It doesn't, we say, oh, but it has feelings. No, that's, you perceive that behavior as love towards you. But that, you know, that same animal would love anybody that treated it the way you did. It didn't single you out, you know, give you those big eyes. It's because you're feeding it bacon or whatever, you know? <laughs> You, you go find the nastiest mutt alive, and if you start eating the bacon every, you know, all the time, it's going to love you too. All of a sudden, you're going to be its best friend. So it's not like they have these certain feelings for certain people, and the animals experience this range of emotions like human beings. They don't. We just interpret it that way. They say, oh, it loves me. A dog is man's best friend. No, it's not. There's a friend that's taken closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. So... You know, God, and I'm not against people having pets and loving. Look, I had a pet, I had a dog that I grew up with. You know, I'm endeared to that dog. I see other dogs that remind me of it. You know, and I, I'm like, oh, it's like my old dog. I get it. You know, we we have a, a develop an emotional bond. The animal doesn't. Okay, it's just like, it's no different. As, you know, if you're all of a sudden your recliner, you know, grew eyes and ears and a tail. You know, and you know what I mean. Or maybe horns, you know, with spots, and then you could skin it and eat it. I mean, they're just animated objects. That's what I'm talking about. Where was I at? Where was I even going with that? Right, animals. God does not overvalue, overestimate the worth of animals. 
What, so, okay, well then what is it there for? I, I spent long enough explaining what Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 isn't about. Well, why is it there? Because it's symbolic in purpose, and it's symbolic of the fact that the laborer is worthy of his hire. He's saying, look, if the ox is busy doing work, let him eat. If he's grinding out the corn, let him have some of the corn that he, while he's grinding out. That's why he's saying, don't muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox, while he grindeth out the corn, saying... You know, he should just only work and not enjoy the fruits of his labor. He shouldn't have, be partaker of, what, of the work that he's doing. And he put that in there specifically, uh, I believe, for to refer not only to, to those that minister in the New Testament. Look there, Luke, uh, you're going to Luke 8, I'll read you from Luke 10. Jesus said, into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be in this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn unto you, uh, turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such thing as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, though not from house to house. He's saying, look, if you go to a house while you're out preaching the gospel, and, and they may receive you, you know, don't go to another house. Just stay there. Let your peace be upon it. And let them take care of you as you go out and minister. Luke chapter 8, look at verse 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went, and this is Jesus, through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, called uh, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of uh, Cuzza, Herod's steward, and uh, Susanna, and many others, which did what? Which ministered unto him out of their substance. So he's saying, giving his list of ladies, as well as others, that ministered to him of their substance. Meaning they gave money, they gave food, they gave raiment, they gave a place to stay. Now, was that because Jesus was some bum? Or was it because he was working? And it says right there, he's going throughout every city and village. He's walking to all these different places. And what's he doing? He's preaching and preaching his work. Anyone that's gone out and done any soul winning knows that. That, you know, you've got to muster it up the courage to go knock on the door. You know, give it a few more months. You'll see just how much work it is. When it gets, let's not even talk about how much it is. <laughs> Right? So we'll enjoy what we we'll have. But you know it's work. You go out there and do that. You know, getting up, writing the sermons, preaching it, delivering it. You know, that's all work. And he's saying, look, he went out and did this, and other people ministered unto him of their substance. <clears throat> so either Jesus here is doing work, or he's in violation of Scripture. Because the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, Jesus shouldn't be taking that food there, that, that substance that they're ministering, if he's not working. He should go get a job. What it's showing us is that what he was doing was working, and he was laboring, and the laborer is worthy of his hire. And these things are, are considered labor. <clears throat> you know, the, 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 uh, verse 4 of Deuteronomy 25 is showing us that the laborer is worthy of his hire, and that what? That minister should be paid by the local church. You know, and you say, oh, you're going to talk about money. Well, it's verse 4. What else is it about? <laughs> and that's what it's about, folks. Yep. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He quotes it in exactly that regard. And you say, well, why, you know, and we don't have a problem here with this, but, you know, there are some churches like the Mormon church that doesn't pay them for the people that minister. And those guys aren't worth their salt anyway because they're preaching damnable lies anyway. Yep. But they brag about it. Well, we don't pay our ministers. Well, that's just another unbiblical belief that you have. That just shows, you know, that's even more evidence that you don't understand Scripture. Bingo. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Who goeth to warfare any time in his own charges? You know, if you enlist in the army, they're going to be like, I'm, we're, we're glad you're here, son. Now go buy a gun and come on back. Get yourself some boots and fatigues and a weapon, you know. No, they're going to supply all of that. Who goeth to warfare any time in his charges? Who planteth the vineyard even without the fruit thereof? Who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Saith these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So why is that there? Doth God take care for oxen? No. Or saith it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth, and hope should be partaker of his hope. Jump down to verse 13. Do you not know they which minister about the holy things live of the holy things of the temple? So he's referring back to the Levitical priesthood. Saying, look, just like the Old Testament, the priests 
their job was to minister at the temple, <laughs> to receive the sacrifices, to put them on the altar, to minister about the tabernacle, all the work that went into that, picking it up, putting it down, cleaning it out, all the ceremony that went on there. That was their job, full-time job that they were supposed to do. And he's saying, look, they ministered there and they lived of those things that were brought to the temple. Then they that wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so, meaning in the same way, the Lord hath ordained that they who, which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And that's referring to, you know, the priesthood living off the tithes. And he's saying, look, in the same way today, you know, the, the, the preachers, you know, the pastors, the deacons, the, the, the members, the, those that are employed by the church should live of the tithes of the church. That's what that's teaching. Amen. And a lot of people want to argue with that today. Because here's, there's, there's so many, you'd be very hard pressed to find a church that doesn't understand that. I mean, that's clear. That's clear scripture right there, verse Corinthians 9. And you'll be very hard pressed to find a church that doesn't believe that. Any church that's doing anything for God anyway, that actually has a full-time staff or pastor, so on and so forth, that's getting something done. You know, uh, you'll be hard to press to find that. So as a result, people who want to stay out of church, they'll just say, well, you should, they'll, they'll twist that doctrine. And just say, well, tithing is Old Testament. And therefore, any church that practices it is not, is not right, and I'm not going to go. You just excuse yourself from the like 99.999% of all churches that are out there. Because you're so spiritual. And you figured out something that the vast majority of Christianity hasn't. Everybody else has got it wrong, but you've got it right on the subject. So that you can just sit at a church and feel spiritual about it. That's what's going on about that. You say, oh, you're just preaching that because you're the deacon and you're on staff. Look, I made my mind up about this before I even knew who Pastor Anderson was. Amen. I made my mind up about tithing, and I started doing That was one of the first things I did when I, when I got saved. When someone showed me that, explained it, I heard it preached. I didn't say, well, I'll just wait till I'm on staff to agree with that. <laughs> so that's not the motive at all. But, you know, that's what, first, that's what verse 4 is about. I don't want to spend the rest of the night on that, so let's move on. Look at verse 5. There's a lot here. We've got to get through it. He says, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him, uh, him to, to wife, and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which, uh, which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, and that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let, it, and then let his brother's wife go to the gate of the elders, unto the elders, and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. Uh, he will not perform the duty of my, uh, of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him, and his brother's wife shall come into the presence of the elders, and loose, uh, and loose his shoe from off his foot, and spit in his face. So if, she, if he did not live up to this, She's literally, she's to take off his shoe and then spit in his face. And that's one of the just most insulting, just, just degrading things you can do to somebody is to spit in their face. And God's saying, do it. Saying it's a, so he's saying, look, it's a shameful thing if a man will not perform the duty of a husband for in his brother's stead unto his wife and raise up seed after him. <clears throat> and he says, uh, and his name shall be called in Israel. So he's going to have a name. Right, then they're going to nickname him too. The house of him that has his, hath his shoe loosed. And that's a mouthful. <laughs> you know, there goes him that hath the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. You know, but why? What was the purpose of that? So that guy would have to have that shame upon him. Yep. Everyone would know that's the guy that, that wouldn't. You know, was so cold-hearted towards his own brother that he would not perform his duty. <laughs> and he says. Uh, when, uh, and then he goes on in verse 11. When men strive together one with another, and the wife of the one put it, uh, draweth near to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him. So if the husband's losing, and the wife's like, well, I'm not going to let my man just get beat here. So she goes in there to try and stick up for her man. And it says, uh, and, and draw to deliver him out of him that smiteth, and put it forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets. Now the secrets, that's the part of a man's body that only a man has. Okay? Now that's it. And he taketh him by the secrets. Then thou shalt cut off her hand, and thine eye shall not pity her. So he, I believe this bunch of verses are kind of all pointing towards one thing. And that's the importance of a man having a heritage. 
You know, if the secrets are damaged, you know, that's the, there goes your family life, as the saying goes, right? That's what God is saying. You're looking, and I believe he's putting a premium on this. He's putting uh, the importance on the fact that a man should have an heritage, that a man should raise up children after him, and that it's, it's, a, it's not a good thing if... I should have had you stay in Proverbs, but go back to Proverbs 22. If, if your name is just forgotten from the earth. <clears throat> He's saying in Proverbs, go to Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Go to Proverbs 17. I just read it. Proverbs 17. You know, it's good to have a good name. You know, and if you don't raise up godly children after you, you know, your name kind of goes away. It disappears. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, the world's never going to recognize any of us. We're never going to go down. You know, I don't expect that, you know, they're going to ask us to come put our hands in the, in the, the Walk of Fame in Hollywood. You know, no one's going to be carving my image next to George Washington and Mount Rushmore, right? Or any of us, and I wouldn't want the aim of that anyway. But you know what? My name will be remembered, and that little blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid that sits up here who has the same name as me, Corbin John Russell III, right? And it's not because we're you know, English monarchs or something. <laughs> you know, it's because he's the third one in a row, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the purpose behind that, you know, and that I did that. You know, my dad asked me to do that. You know, he, I was named after him. He said, you need your son after me. So I did that. And so the purpose being that that name will continue. And we'll think about, you know, within our family, so a lot of other people won't know who Corbin John Russell is. But within my family, you know, they will. They'll think about, oh, there was this Corbin John Russell, and then before him there was that one. And the memory will live on. So what, that's what he's showing. I believe that's what he's showing us here. You know, in saying that a brother should raise up seed unto, his, uh, unto the deceased, his dead brother, by taking his brother's wife to him, and not leaving her desolate in the process, but taking her unto him and raising up a seed, and the firstborn being named after him and not himself. You know, he could name the next one after him, but... And then, and then the part about, you know, the woman that taketh them by the secrets having her hand cut off, you know, showing us that that's a valuable thing to a man, to raise up seed after him, to have that ability. Amen. <laughs> so we should desire to have our name, our, our name, we should desire as men to have our remembrance, you know, carry on beyond our, our own lives. You know, we should desire as men that our children will look back on us fondly and tell stories about us. And even our grandchildren, you know, if we live long enough, that if that's our desire, you know, uh, that they will they will, will call us fondly and tell stories. I mean, I, I hear people talk about their grandparents often. Well, not often, but, you know, I do hear that from time to time. People talk, telling stories about how their grandpa was this guy or that guy. I mean, Pastor Anderson's a great example. Just last night in his sermon, you know, he's talking about how how his his great his grandfather was known as this great soul winner that was known for winning hard cases Amen. to the Lord. I mean, that's a good that's something I want for myself one day. And I want my my grandchildren to look back and say, oh my, you know my great great my grandpa Corbin, you know he he was a, a deacon at a Baptist church and you know he he uh, he he led a church that knocked every door in the city of Tucson. Amen. That's a great heritage right there. That's something that I, I'd be look down in heaven and be like, yeah, I did do that. <laughs> Amen. You know, and you all would be able to say, yeah, we helped him do it. Amen. Right? And your kids would say that about you. Yeah, he was a faithful member in a church, and he won souls to the Lord, and right. did a great work for God. And he taught me this about the Bible. He taught me this about the Bible. And he, and he showed me the way how to live for God. That's a goodly heritage. That's what we should want. You know, it's important that, that men have that. You know, it's sad when a man dies and he doesn't have any heritage. It's unfortunate. And we think about Absalom, right? I mean, he was a wicked enough guy to begin with. But one of the worst things about his life is the fact that it, when it says in, in, in 18, in 2 Samuel 18, when he died, and now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself, he did it for himself, a pillar. Nobody else put it up in his honor. He did it. And he reared up a pillar, which is in the king's dale, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. So he has no son to keep his name in remembrance. So he sets up this pillar and calls it after his own name so that somebody would remember something about him. And it is called unto Absalom, uh, this day Absalom's place. But you want, I wonder how many people took note of that pillar and for how long. 
I mean, they probably, I mean, if it weren't in Bible, the Bible, we would never even know about it. Right. I mean, how long do you think it took? How many generations had to go by to someone? What was that pillar about again? I, I can't remember. I don't remember. I don't know. It was something about some guy. <laughs> some, and what was his name? Abra, 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 I can't remember. Right? It's forgotten. Right. That's a sad, I mean, he was a bad enough guy to begin with, but what a sad ending to his life, too. <clears throat> You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, where you are, look at verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of, chil of the children are their fathers. It says that having grandchildren, that's a crown unto an old man. I mean, that's an accomplishment, it's saying. You raise up uh, uh, children, and then those children go out, and they have children. You know, and that's, that's a crown upon an old man's head. I mean, I'm going to take my time getting there. I'm in no rush. You know, but I look. I pray that one day I experience that. That before I pass off this earth and go to be with the Lord, that I get to see my grandchildren. I think that'd be amazing. I mean, it'll probably bring a tear in my eye to, to see that first grandbaby be born. That's, that's something special. So that's what I believe. You know, Deuteronomy five through twelve is kind of showing us there. You know, why is God putting these laws in place? Because it's important for a man to have a heritage. It's important for a man to be remembered. We say, well, why does it? We're going to heaven. We're going to live forever. You know, well, it's because of the fact that those that are going to come after you need to follow in your example. You, know, you should want to set that example for them. <clears throat> you know, we should, so the best way to have a heritage that's going to remember you and think upon you fondly, you know, is to lead them by example. You know, set the example for them, and then they will follow in your footsteps. You know, and they'll think back on you. And say, wow, you know, I, my, my, my grandpa did this. My dad did this. He's the one that taught me this. He's the one that showed me how to do win souls. And he took me on this soul winning trip and that soul winning trip. And, you know, he took me out soul winning every week and showed me how to win souls to Christ. And I saw him, you know, with just all kinds of different people. And, and, and just set that good example. The best way to make sure that your name is remembered and thought on is to, to lead by example and to serve the Lord. Go ahead and turn over to, uh, well, just to turn back to Deuteronomy. I'm going to have to turn, we'll wrap it up here. But the Bible says in Psalm 16, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a godly heritage. You know, the world can give you a lot of things. The world has a lot to offer when it comes to material things. They can give you money. They can give you possessions. They can give you fame. They can give you pleasure. They can give you all these things. But they can't give you a good heritage. They can't give you a, 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 a line of people that are going to remember you. You know, that's why these people get, you know, they want to be immortalized in film or something like that. You know, these, these, these actors and things like that, or these recording artists. Yeah. They think, oh, I'll be remembered for eternity. No, you won't. Yep. You know, people, what are they going to remember you for? Some sleazy movie, some dirty song. Yep. You know, you're just going to be a jingle at some point in the, in the world's eyes. But do you think that some godly man that raises up a righteous seed that follows after him is going to have that problem? That the people are going to think about him and just be like, and not hold him in regard, and not hold him in high esteem? So, you know, the world can give you a lot of things, but they can't give you a, a, a God-fearing seed that comes after you. Only you can provide that. And the Lord, of course... But we're the only, you know, we as men, we're the only ones that can provide that for ourselves. And we have to do that by leading through example. Go ahead and look at verse 13. We'll get down here. It says, Thou shalt not have thy bag in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thy house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, and thou shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So what he's talking about is, you know, don't have a false balance. You know, when you're weighing out, you know, they would trade and they would, this is how they exchange goods. You know, they get so many, I don't know what the word, you know, get so many, an ephah or so many shekels or whatever. You know, they're saying, well, let's put it in a scale and you've got some trick scale. It's like the double-headed coin. I'll flip you for it, you know. You don't know that it's a head on both sides. No, heads, I win again. How does he do it? You know, it's a trick. And God's saying, don't, don't have that kind of thing going on. And, and you know, maybe you want to be perfect. You want to do what's right. You want to have integrity in business is what he's teaching here. We want people to try to cut corners in business. And look, it's getting bad. People are doing this all the time. 
people are trying to you know skim skim people out of money, scam them out of money, you know, uh, get cheaper product, charge them more than they should. You know, you know, get down to the end. You know, it's like, oh, it's time to fill up the invoice. So let me just tack on a few extra hours that didn't actually work. You know, that's a false balance. You know, we don't have literal scales today, but we have things that are equivalent to it. You know, and, and people should be should be have integrity in their business dealings. You know, and you think, well, I just need to make a little extra money. What's it going to hurt? You know, they'd be willing to pay it anyway. What does it matter? Well, it's because God sees it. You know, God says that He doesn't want that. And if you'll do it right, he says that thy days will be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. You know who God's going to bless? The guy, he looks down and he says he's, his business dealings are right. He has integrity. God's going to bless that guy. Maybe you're not going to make all that money in that job that you could have by kind of, you know, fudging things a little bit. But when you have integrity, God's just going to make sure that there's a, there is a next job. And maybe that job's going to even be even better. You know, and maybe the margins will be better on the next job. Maybe God will bless you with that. I mean, how long is it going to take to put yourself out of business if work gets around? Hey, this guy's a crook. You know, people that you know, people will try to make all their money at once by taking somebody's head off when when, it, when the bill comes due, and they're like, "Well, I'm never going to deal with that guy again." You know, you want the return customer. But notice again in this verse, what's interesting, he says in verse 16, For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. He didn't say they commit abomination, he said they are. So whenever you see God, you know, the Bible, pointing out the fact that it's not just the sin that's abomination, but the sinner that's an abomination. We should probably take careful note to never be guilty of this. When God says all that do such things are an abomination... It's not just the act that God is disgusted by. It's the person that he's calling an abomination. Do you see that there? He say those that do it are an abomination. Look at verse 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you are come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. So this guy's wicked. You know, he's coming on, he's picking on the weak, he's picking on the, the feeble and, he's, and why? Because he has no fear. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thy enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. He's saying you're not going to say, oh, well, you know, I understand, you Amalekites, that was another generation. He's saying, no, there's, you know, there's a punishment for what you did. And it, it doesn't matter when it comes. You know, and that's something you know, America should probably take heed to. In fact, it's probably too late. We've been going around picking on the weak and right. picking on those that are faint and weary for a long time. You know, just bombing people from afar. You know, just taking advantage of people that are, are can't defend themselves against our military superiority. You know, that's been going on since the foundation of this country. Even I mean, there's a, just a history of that, of just bloody oppression. On, on, on the part of our country. And you know what? Uh, God's not going to forget it. God's not going to say, oh, it was those people long ago. Or, well, you know, the Iraq War and all that, you know, you know, the bombings over there that you guys did, you know, building your empire, and that was another generation. God's going to remember it. Okay? God brings it back. He avenges the weak. God doesn't just let innocent, you know, I don't want to say necessarily innocent, but just weak, defenseless people be oppressed and just go, well, it's too bad. God keeps track of it, and God keeps the tally, and God repays. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So we should be afraid to afflict those that God will defend. You know, be afraid to afflict somebody. You know, here's the, here's the bottom line. Don't be a bully. You know, it, just because you're, you know, tougher, bigger, and badder, it doesn't give you the right to just go around and pick on weak people. And we should, we should not do that because who's going to ultimately stick up for people like that? God. And how's He going to do it? By putting us down. By by oppressing them. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. You know, God's going to protect them. The wicked have it coming. You know, sometimes we feel like that. We feel like, well, we're the ones that are getting picked on. You know, we're the weak. We're the oppressed. We're the poor. We're the ones that can't defend our... The wicked prosper. You know, the wicked, are their eyes stand out with fatness. 
You know, they have no want of anything. And it just seems like the, every, the, their life just goes so well. We're the, you know, we're trying to live a godly life. And we're the ones that are struggling. We're the ones that can't get by. We're the ones that are having to deal with, you know, the, you know, the government trying to come down. And we don't have it that bad yet, but it's coming. You know, we, we start to worry and fret. But the Bible says in Psalms 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. <clears throat> fret not thyself of him who oppresseth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass, cease from anger, <clears throat> forsake wrath, fret not thyself any wise to do evil. You know, you know, don't repay evil with evil. Why? For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You know, these wicked men that are oppressing and ruling and, and, and waging war and, and, and hate God and hate God's people and promoting wickedness and filth, that are just prospering, they're going to be cut off one day. And who's going to inherit the earth that they covet? The meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. Verse 10, for yet a little while, God calls it a little while. You know, we look at human history and all the, just how it just seems like every, it's just a long line of like oppress, oppressive dictatorship after oppressive dictatorship, just genocide after genocide, just innocent blood upon innocent blood. But just throughout all of human history, God says, for yet a little while. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. He's saying, look, it's not going to be long. You won't even know. Those people won't even exist. They'll be gone. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place. It shall not be. But the meek shall inherit delight, and inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So it's kind of, you know, a reminder there at the end about the fact that God, you know, he sticks up for the downtrodden. That God, you know, remembers the oppression of those that cannot defend themselves. You know, and we can take open that as well. You know, we can be warned by that, and we can also be comforted by that fact that God uh, protects the weak. So, you know, rather than just getting caught up in trying to cast our lot with the wicked, you know, who are doomed, you know, and who in a little while they won't even be, won't even see their place, you know, let's set the example. Let's be as shining lights in a crooked and perverse nation, as the Bible says. And we'll wait for the day when true justice will be delivered. When, you know, these, these oppressive systems like prisons that man has set up will no more be. Yep. You know, in the meantime, let's just live a godly life. Let's not fret ourselves in any wise to do evil, but let's just focus on setting a good example for those that are going to come after us so we can have that goodly, care, goodly heritage. Let's go ahead and pray.